Good day. We will now be presenting to you the Liberation Theologian's Christology and the problems associated with it. The emergence of Liberation Theology is usually associated with some developments in the Roman Catholic theology since the Second Vatican Council which led to the decision taken by the Latin American bishops at their Episcopal Conference at Medellin in 1968 to take a preferential option for the poor. The concept of theologies based on liberation began to surface in the middle of the 20th century, but the term theology of liberation was not used until Gustavo Gutierrez's famous work, A Theology of Liberation, was published in 1971. One major outstanding feature of liberation theology, which distinguishes it from other radical theological perspectives, is its conviction that Christianity and its basic symbols must be reinterpreted from the perspective of the poor and oppressed in the light of the popular struggles for social justice. In this output, we intend to give you a general idea how liberation theology presents who Christ is and some of the issues that arose with its Christology along with magisterial documents that respond to this radical theology. The Methodological Primacy of the Historical Jesus A Christology from Below Leonardo Boff, John Sobrino, and Juan Segundo begin with the assumption that in order to relate Jesus Christ to the current situation in Latin America, it is necessary to commence any sort of discourse about him from the perspective of the concrete history. A relevant Christology will be one that begins from below, that begins by looking at Jesus in his humanity, so that discourse about him will be relevant to human beings. Only discourse about human being would be relevant to human beings. Hence, Christology must be from below, rather from above. Liberation Christology does not begin with the priori affirmation of Jesus' deity. They prefer to call his divinity, but rather to look his humanity to see what in his person, namely his intentions, words, and actions, occasion the affirmation that his man was God. For Sobrino then, discourse about the incarnation and salvation can only be intelligible and coherent only from the point of departure of the historical Jesus. Leonardo Boff also sees the need to begin with the historical Jesus. According to him, the reduction of Christology to a study of Christ of faith Jesus Christ is interpreted by the community without any concern of the experience of the historical Jesus, impoverishes Christianity's comprehensive vision. By beginning with the historical Jesus, these liberation theologians hope to interpret the doctrines of the Incarnation and the Atonement in a way that might be relevant to the experience of oppression and exploitation of the Latin America people. In short, what they are trying to do is simply to give them theological attention that the life of Jesus so fully deserves, but which so far has been overlooked. Having established the importance in approaching Christology through the historical Jesus, liberation theologians begin to discuss the mystery of the Incarnation. Since Christological reflection begins from below, it begins with historical, then what is clearly evident as a rational tenable datum is that Jesus is a human being. The affirmation of his humanity follows logically from his historicity. Sobrino puts his best when it he writes, Liberation Christology, like the Gospels, affirms Jesus' humanity, narratively, that is, not through abstract speculation or philosophical argumentation about what constitutes human nature, but simply by narrating a, a story that identifies Jesus as intending, acting, and feeling as human beings do. For Leonardo Boff, the affirmation of Jesus' full humanity is important for liberation in two ways, one negative and the other positive. He declares, first, this, is, this humanity revealed in Jesus' historical pilgrimage exposes which is non-human, 
This historical pilgrimage represents the realization of true humanity. He recovers our genuine identity as human. Secondly, Jesus' human nature reveals the eschatological new human being, the human person that God intended from eternity. This human nature comes to its full manifestation in the resurrection. Both continues, If Jesus is truly a human being, then that which is asserted of him must also be affirmed in some manner of each person. Having Jesus, the most perfect of all human beings, as our starting point, we can see who we are and how we are. On Jesus' divinity, liberation theologians seek to approach Jesus from an angle different from that of academic Christology, which assumes that Jesus is humanly interesting or significant because he is recognized as God. Instead, they want to argue that Jesus is recognized as God because he is humanly interesting. Jesus' divinity, therefore, follows from his humanity. If Jesus is recognized as proclaimed as God, it must be because there is something inherently present in the life of Jesus, in all historicity that merits it. Access to Jesus' divinity, whether in an objective or subjective way, must come through his humanity and not the other way around say liberation theologians. This approach to Jesus is justifiable in that it replicates the process of coming to believe of Jesus, disciples themselves. We have seen that liberation theologians are particular in their Christology. They strive to make Jesus Christ relevant in the oppressive situation in Latin America. First is the priority of the historical Jesus. The discussion of the humanity of Jesus makes it easier to relate Christ to human beings. Second, and as a logical consequence of the first priority, is Jesus' humanity. Liberation theologians affirm the humanity of Jesus. In the Gospels, we hear the narration of the humanity of Jesus. He experiences hunger, thirst, and even died on the cross. Third, and contingent on that humanity, is the affirmation of Jesus' divinity. If Jesus is recognized and proclaimed as God, then there must be a reason for it in the historic city of Jesus. There must be something that strikes the people to say Christ is divine. Carlos Piar, in his dissertation, speaks of Jesus as a trailblazer. A trailblazer is a pioneer, an innovator, or a pathfinder, one who blazes a trail to guide others. To speak of Jesus as a trailblazer is a suitable metaphor for understanding how liberation theologians conceive of his significance for humanity. A historical Christology results in teachings on salvation with historical perspectives making it easier to guide others. Too much emphasis on Christ of faith results in a dehistoricized Jesus, a Jesus who remains in the dogmatic levels of faith. By reflecting on the totality of the life of Jesus, liberation theologians hope to show that the salvation that Jesus provides is an integral salvation, liberation from personal sin and also collective liberation from structural sin, sin which is the result of man's action. Liberation theologians want to show that Jesus paves the way for the realization of a full humanity, the divinization of humanity through the observance of the teachings of Christ, a full liberation or salvation from every form of oppression. Liberation theologians look at Jesus from within history, Christology from below, that Jesus is understood in relational terms. This means that salvific and ethical significance of Jesus is revealed in his relationship as son to God and brother to the marginalized. Liberation theologians discover that there is an uncompromising commitment to subversiveness in the relationship between God and man. Jesus overthrows the prevailing conceptions about God and how to relate with Him and to one another. According to Bob, 
Jesus showed that a child of God remains loyal to the Father, since when, threatened with death, he clung to his course, obedient to the Father and resisting all temptations. This obedience, even to death, expressed his radical faithfulness as son to the Father. Like Christ, oppressed Latin Americans believe that life is a journey of faith, and the twists and turns on that journey cannot be foreknown. But whatever path they take, whatever conflicts they might encounter along the way, they must nevertheless maintain their commitment to God, their total fidelity, since that is what it means to be a son or daughter of God. This faithfulness to God is not cultic in nature, but a personal commitment. It is not a privatized faith consisting of lighting candles, recitation of creeds and prayers, attending ceremonies and processions. It is a faith that expresses itself in concrete solidarity with the oppressed in their struggle for liberation. A faith that makes itself concrete by subverting everything that alienates people from God and one another. In his brotherhood, Jesus demonstrated a humble commitment to others, a commitment that was made historically concrete in his ministry. According to Sobino, from a theological viewpoint and surely from a historical viewpoint, human beings, Christ's brothers and sisters, are the poor and insignificant. By being a brother to the marginalized, Jesus demonstrated three things. First, theologically. He demonstrated that God is a partisan, that God takes sides. He takes the side of the poor and the oppressed. God does not want people to suffer. If we want to find God, we have to go to people who are suffering. Jesus who suffers wants to be with the suffering. Second, anthropologically. He demonstrated that to be truly human is to be someone who sides with the oppressed. The preferential option for the poor challenges and alarms Christians with power and money. This is also an invitation to reflect our place in the society and in the world. Are we helping or harming people? Third, ethically. He showed that faith is demonstrated by a wholehearted commitment to others. That, to claim that one is a son of God, one must stand shoulder to shoulder with those who are also God's own, including the oppressed, in their struggle for liberation. As disciples of Jesus, we should learn to detach ourselves from riches that we may develop love for the poor and the unfortunate. By doing so, we respect the dignity of their humanity. This is the observance of the supreme commandment of love, the full recognition of the dignity of each individual. This is a ministry, a call to subversiveness. It is the proclamation and practice of Jesus that enables liberation theologians to understand Jesus and specify the task of Christians. Thus, to get any understanding of Jesus' as person as human divine and of the significance of his life for humanity, one must delve into the meaning of his central message, the Kingdom of God. For them, the Kingdom of God is total, partial, historical, and radical. First, the totality refers to its extent. It involves all human existence and the integral liberation that it brings with it. Second is, the Kingdom of God is historical since it can be re realized in history. Third, the Kingdom of God is also partial in its admission. The Kingdom is not for everyone. Jesus offered it to the poor and oppressed. It is they who have entrance into the Kingdom. Lastly, the Kingdom of God is radical in its requirements. The values and demands serve as a standard in judging all human attainments. Jesus' death, the consequence of subversiveness. Liberation theologians see Jesus' death as the inevitable consequence of a praxis or act of liberation that result of challenging the oppressive structure that existed in Palestine at that time. The historical meaning, then, 
is that Jesus dies as a consequence of his subversiveness. Jesus' death is the direct result of a determinate pra praxis, the conscious challenge of political religious structures that oppressed and marginalized people. In Passion de Cristo, Passion del Mundo, both makes explicit that Jesus' suffering and death are model of suffering and death which the Latin American people must endure for the sake of liberation, of trying to establish partial mediations of the kingdom of God. In the face of suffering or evil, what is required is not resignation and much less legitimation, but a struggle, Jesus' death. The cross speaks of a struggle against suffering. Both knows that evil does not exist to be understood but to be fought. So for Segundo, as for both and Sobrino, Jesus dies for being a subversive, for challenging through his words indeed the power structures that oppress and marginalizes human beings. Jesus' death we see then is not a tragedy as if it had befallen him. Unexpectedly, it is a heroic death because it is the result of an unswerving commitment to the truth of God and the God of truth and a de determinate praxis on behalf of the oppressed. Jesus' resurrection, the worthwhileness of subversiveness. For liberation theologians, the resurrection is God's statement that He approved of what Jesus did and is, therefore, a basis hope for those who are crucified, for those who are willing to act and die for liberation. The resurrection for them is not only for God's seal of approval on Jesus' message and praxis, it also reveals that God is just since He would not let injustice triumph over justice. As Sabrina said, pictured in this way, the resurrection of Jesus shows that justice has triumph over justice, the victim over the executioners. For both, the resurrection of Jesus holds a similar significance. It is a protest against the so-called justice and law by which Jesus was condemned. It is Jesus' resurrection, therefore, that makes a life of struggling and suffering for liberation worthwhile. Jesus' resurrection demonstrates that fighting and dying for, for justice are not in vain, for it is God Himself who vindicated Jesus and will vindicate those who replicate Jesus' praxis. It is not surprising that a radical form of theology, like the liberation theology, will face a whole range of criticism and objection, particularly from the Catholic Church. One of the key objections to the content of liberation theology is that liberation theologians misinterpret the biblical message and misunderstand key Christian ideas. This occurs because they interpret the Bible in the light of experience and making use of Marxist ideas and analysis. There will be no other and better way to identify and understand these doctrinal and Christological issues than through two instruction issued by the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith as a direct response to liberation theology. One major Christological issue in liberation theology given in the instruction is that faith in the Christ who died for all men and whom God made Lord and Christ is denied. In its place is substituted a figure of Jesus who is a kind of symbol who sums up in himself the requirements of the struggle of the oppressed. The Christological conception of liberation theology reveals that the importance of Jesus lies in his exemplary struggle for the poor and the outcast, not in his divinity and not ever in his redemptive death. Liberation theologians see Jesus' teaching and action as only demonstrating the love of God on behalf of the kingdom of God in a historical situation 
that is strikingly similar to the Latin American context or that of any other third world country where oppression and poverty proliferates. For them, Jesus' incarnation can only be meaningful in terms of his total immersion in a historical situation of conflict and oppression. The instruction also notes that for liberation theologians, an exclusively political interpretation is thus given to the death of Christ. In this way, its value of salvation and the whole economy of redemption is denied. They reduce the redemptive mission of Christ to mere political concern for the poor and oppressed, and deny the vicariousness of his death or to replace it with the mere identification with the plight of the poor and oppressed. It follows then that Jesus' incarnation and death on the cross would be regarded as only for the benefit of the poor and the oppressed. The rich and oppressors would have no part or share in his salvific event. Of equal importance is the emphasis of liberation theology on the kingdom of God which understand it basically in terms of its enactment in history and with reference to its political implication for the liberation of the oppressed in the here and now. They identify the kingdom of God and its growth with the human liberation movement and make history itself the subject of its own development as a process of the self-redemption to man or by means of the class struggle. There is also a serious theological problem with liberation theology's view of sin as part of bad social structure which fails to highlight personal sin. Liberation theologians may not actually overlook the sinfulness of man completely, but when personal sin is acknowledged at all, they maintain that it exists because of oppressive political and social structures. For us Christians, sin as separation from God is a struggle which confronts the oppressor as well as the oppressed. But the manner in which liberation theology lays emphasis on the poor leaves one with the impression that the poor are the exclusive object of God's concern, the exclusive subject of God's salvation and revelation, and that the cry of the oppressed alone represent the voice of God. In this sense, salvation to the liberationist is man's effort to free himself from political, economic, and social oppression. From all indications, it is quite obvious that liberation theology overemphasizes the temporal problems of this present life with little or no regard for the spiritual issues of the future eternal life. There are five major documents published by the Vatican during the two decades after the birth of liberation theology. These are, first, Octogesimo Adveniens, second, Evangelii Nunciandi, third, Libertatis Nonchus, fourth, Libertatis Consentia, and last, Solicitudo Rei Socialis. In Octogesima Adveniens, Pope Paul VI discusses the role of individual Christians and local churches in responding to situations of injustices. Pope Paul VI identifies a strong link between authentic development and true liberation. This too must be manifested in the exercise of solidarity, will for justice and equality, virtues that the Pope exhorts all religious to exhibit. By the mid-1970s, Liberation theology had become a matter of great controversy in the Catholic Church. Evangelii Nunciandi was a carefully thought-out response to the confusion engendered by both liberation theology and the conciliar recognition that seeds of truth were found in various non-Christian religions by clearly and eloquently reaffirming that the liberation that Christ brings is foundationally a liberation from sin in its consequences and from the devil, and that salvation is not just about changing the structures of society, it is about eternal life. However, 
as a more direct response to the growth of liberation theology, especially in Latin America, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith published an instruction on certain aspects of theology of liberation in 1984. It serves as a warning about certain deviations in liberation theology teachings. It also attacked liberation theology's Marxist assumptions and political ideologies. The instruction on certain aspects of a theology of liberation lays out two main critiques on liberation theology. First, it focuses on liberation theology's over-politization of liberation, which makes secondary the evangelical aspect and lacks a firm grounding in the gospel. Just two years later, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith Publish instruction on Christian freedom and liberation as a follow-up to the original critique. Although this later document acknowledges the validity of theology of liberation and constantly reaffirms the church commitment to the cause of the poor, marginalized, and oppressed, something with which both Vatican and liberation theologians can easily agree, it maintained many of the same reservations as the 1984 document. The congregation argues that liberation theologians place too much of their focus on political or physical liberation, allowing liberation from sin to become secondary or even ignored. Rather than focusing on changing structures, we are encouraged to emphasize evangelization to save hearts and convert those who participate in oppressive structures. The congregation for the doctrine of the faith, further critique liberation theology for one of the common roots taken in order to overcome this oppression. It goes on specifically to critique one method of social analysis that has been especially controversial in liberation theology's development, which is Marxism. According to this document as a whole, acceptance of exclusively Marxist ideas necessarily leads to an acceptance of Marxist strategy, a concept that is, at its core, is incompatible with Catholic beliefs. The last magisterial document released that is somehow a response or in relation to, liber to liberation theology is the Solicitudo Rei Socialis. In this encyclical, its social teachings on the structures of sin is most significant because for the first time, a papal encyclical takes cognizance of the relatively new concept of social sin, which was from Vatican II, emphasized by the 1971 Synod on Justice in the world as well as liberation theology in the Third World. The encyclical now calls social sin as structures of sin and consider it as barriers to human development. In response to it, Pope John Paul II proposes solidarity based on respect for human person as agent for authentic human development. The parallel histories of Philippines in Latin America, of course, do not necessitate a parallel growth of liberation theology, but having a certain history of colonialism and a host of political, religious, environmental factors indicates that the birth of a movement toward liberation theology is not unprecedented. Since the Second Vatican Council, more and more religious and lay leaders in the Philippines have been working to organize and increase the class consciousness of the poor to improve their economic circumstances. Latin American liberation theologies and variant forms of Marxist theory somehow influenced this social action workers who paved the way for BEC movement or the Basic Ecclesial Community. The Mary Knowles missionaries initiated BECs in Dabao as early as 1967, and this program is spread throughout Mindanao. Many of these missionaries had experienced organizing and working with Comunidades Ecclesiales de Base in Latin America and thus acted as a diffusive force carrying concepts from Latin America to Asia. The most basic activities consist of liturgical activities 
catering to the spiritual needs of the members. Then, as a BEC becomes more developed, it continues with meeting its members' spiritual needs and begin to accommodate the material needs of its member by performing a developmental function. Finally, the most sophisticated BECs meet both the spiritual and material needs of its members while also acting to transform Philippine society and thus liberate its members from unjust social structures. When martial law was enacted, it put the country in a deplorable position economically and socially, but it did provide a context in which Catholic leaders become increasingly concerned with problems of injustices and the underdevelopment and fostered more and more participation in grassroots movement seeking to give the poor and powerless some voice and power in decisions affecting their lives. The conditions of martial law under the Marcos regime in the Philippines made the political significance of the Catholic Church more apparent. Most other institutions, the Congress, courts, political parties, labor organizations, newspapers, and public broadcasting networks were severely repressed by the military under the Marcos dictatorship. As a result, the Catholic Church emerged as the major voice for the rights of the poor and oppressed inside the nation. The ideas from Latin America certainly affected the actions of those in the Philippines, but the fact that Catholic leaders moved from theory to action or of being concerned about the plight of the poor to aiming to empower those on the margins, it is an enormous step in the right direction. Furthermore, the Catholic Church recognized that falling short in positively meeting the need of our people for national development is also in some ways falling short of her evangelical mission. From this study, we conclude that liberation theology is just one of the new and radical kind of theology that the Church has addressed and continue to address in these modern times, and from the many challenges in terms of faith and morals that the Church has faced in her entire history, we are always left astounded how these challenges has made the Church show the richness and beauty in her teachings as she pronounces her doctrine clearly through magisterial documents that ensued to guide its faithful and to respond to these challenges. Liberation theology has helped the Church in enunciating in its social teaching the praise preferential option for the poor and made her name the existence of social structure or social sins which needed to be condemned. Through the liberation theology, we are enriched in our knowledge of the historical Jesus which gives us some new perspectives to reflect on. On a positive note, we recognized and appreciated the humanistic and humanitarian enthusiasm underlying the unconventional and radical way of interpreting the Bible or hermeneutics of liberation theology. We also learned that while appreciating the humanistic and hum humanitarian motivations of liberation theology's approach, in its interpretation of the scriptures, it should be recognized that using a social analysis like that of the Marxist ideology, which is irreconcilable with the Catholic Christianity, is still dangerous and needs to be rejected. Its compassion for the poor and oppressed and its conviction that passivity and indifference to their plight is unbecoming of true Christianity, and these are quite commendable. We would all agree with the fact that man's inhumanity to man is a terrible sin that deserves God's judgment and Christian resistance. We also learned that reading the Bible stories through a political and social lens could be interesting and enriching, but it would be a mistake to see a political message as its only message. Liberation theologians prioritize dealing with social and structural sin which undermines personal sin as the real problem. We need to recognize that evil structures come from evil people, not the other way around.